us pray. Dear gracious and loving Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for all you've done and all you're going to do. I ask you, Lord, to open up your word. Help us to receive from your word what you'd have us receive and help us to walk in your will and way in all things. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Amen. Let us turn to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. That's Galatians chapter 6, starting with the first verse. That's Galatians chapter 1, starting with the first, uh, chapter 6, starting with the first verse. There's, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is t uh, taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to, uh, to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So we find that if a, breth a brother, if the brethren, well, it says brethren, if a man is overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. You have to first believe that somebody can fall to see the need to restore them. Too many churches today are teaching that you can't fall, so the very notion that somebody could need to be restored is foreign to them. Now, it's true that you could need to be restored and have not actually gone into sin, because it does say a fault here. So you could just be wrong or an error in your doctrine or teachings and still be a Christian. But it still has to be restored because they are in error and that could lead them astray and to where they could lose their soul. I don't know how many times I've heard preachers say, well, as long as they're sincere, it really doesn't matter. Yes, it does. It matters what people believe. What you believe determines what you are. It shows in every aspect of your life. And there have been people who have been pushed farther away because somebody hasn't approached them in the spirit of meekness. They have been too harsh in correcting the error instead of reasoning with them they just demand they change their position. We find that a lot of professed Christians don't have a grasp enough on the scriptures where they can go through and actually discuss and debate teachings in the Bible and go take it back to the scriptures in order to show what the Bible actually says on the subject. And therefore they aren't able to restore somebody in the spirit of meekness. They might know what's right, but they don't know why they know it. Or they may not know what's right, but they think they know what is right. It's important that we know what the Bible says, and it's important we know why we, know, uh, we believe what we believe to where we can restore somebody to the truth. I've come across people that have embraced false doctrine because somebody in a book someplace told them that the scripture says something that it doesn't say. Well, actually, it only says it's only a half truth. It, some of the scriptures say what they say it says, and other scriptures don't. 
and therefore they use it to justify beliefs that are totally unbiblical. For instance, they'll take in the, the scriptures about homosexuality, and some of them, where it refers to sodomy, are distinctly referring to pagan male prostitutes. Now that's true. The Bible does have scriptures that do say that. That if you get into the original language, it's not talking about all homosexuals, it's referring to those. But they are totally overlooking the scriptures and ignoring the scriptures that talks about man with man and woman taking in and uh, tur uh, turning from the, nat uh, the natural affection and all those other scriptures that t speak against homosexuality. But, the, but that's because they're buying into a half-truth, therefore it becomes a lie. And they don't know the scriptures well enough or are unwilling to go back to the source material, and therefore they are un they're ignorant and are believing a lie. That's one way they're justifying all these churches taking and embracing the homosexual cause is because they're totally ignoring the scriptures that condemn it and using other scriptures. They're talking about a totally different subject. They're still not condoning it, but they're still talking about a different subject and saying, well, see, that's the subject the whole thing's about. No, it's not. The Bible does deal with sin. Are we taking and looking into the scriptures and determining what is sin and what is not? The Bible's clear on the subject. But if, if we let people give us a half-baked partial response, we're liable to believe sin is, is good and good is evil. Because they take a bit of scripture here and a bit of scripture there and a bit of scripture someplace else and lead people astray. Now, I grant you, in order to restore such a one, not only do we have to do it in a reasonable fashion, not lording over them, but, they're, uh, but they also have to be reasonable. Because if they're too arrogant to listen, you're not going to get anywhere either. I've come across a lot of people that thought they knew more than God did. I've had people say, well, I don't care what the Bible says. Well, a Christian cannot take that position. The other's already bound for hell, so uh, they can take that position. It's just not a wise position to take. Because the only path to salvation and to Jesus Christ is laid down in the scriptures. So you have to, the only way to live a Christian life is to know what the Bible teaches and live it. It says that we're to bear one another's burdens, but we're also to bear our own burdens. So we're supposed to be concerned about each other's needs. We're supposed to be aware of where each other are with God. And but we're also supposed to be aware of where we are standing in our position with God. That requires us to actually examine ourselves and to be determined, am I living up to the word? Come on in. If we, if we take and are not living up to the word, then we cannot expect God to bless us. God blesses those that are obedient. That's the way he works. So it is important that we know what the Bible says and that we live accordingly. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 18. We're going to start with the 15th verse. That's Matthew chapter 18, starting with the 15th verse.
Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou, sh uh, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto th to thee as a heathen man and a publican. So when we take and are dealing with someone who's trespassed against us, we're not supposed to spread it around. We're supposed to go to them one-on-one. -on -one. It really doesn't matter who they are, how influential they may be. We start out one-on-one. -on -one. And then can you present why the, the fault is in, in place. Chapter and verse. Lay it out. Then if they don't hear thee, they're not listening. Then two or three witnesses, not people that are totally uninvolved, but people who know what's going on. They have, uh, see, if there's not at least two or three witnesses, we're not supposed to take and bring an accusation against somebody anyway. People are too quick in our modern society to accuse each other of things without having any witnesses. It didn't matter what the crime was in, the, in biblical times. You had to have at least two witnesses to make an accusation. So you bring the two the witnesses and then you talk to them. You're trying to take care of this as privately as possible. We're not trying to make a show when you're trying to bring restore somebody back to the position of where God wants them to be. It needs to be done in a respectful private manner. The last and very last thing is to bring it to the church. Only if everything else has failed. Too many today want to bring it to the church first. Or to the court. It, am it amazes me how many people profess Christianity but don't seem to understand that the Bible says that we're supposed to handle our problems within, uh, with, from within, not taking everything to the secular courts. Now, I grant you that's dealing within Christians, dealing with Christians, not the world out here that's living in sin. Because the church has no authority in the position of the sinner. And the church only has authority where the Bible covers. If, the, if Jesus says it's wrong, and the word of God says it's wrong, then we can say it's wrong. If the Bible's silent on the subject, we don't really have much to say on the subject. Too often people drag in tradition for why, why they, they do things. And let's face it, we all do things from tradition. You know, worship styles, a lot of it is tradition. I personally... I've been in, a, in several different styles of worship services. 
some are very exuberant. Some are very quiet. Some have lots of singing. Others don't have hardly any. And you know what? None of them are wrong. Doesn't matter. What's important is, is the word of God coming across. Is God getting the glory? Is God getting the praise? Is God being honored in our lives? That's what's important. God is being honored. That's, uh, that is why we're here. Too many people are uh, arguing over trivial, trivial things that just don't matter. I have seen congregations that were hung up on the length, uh, the length of your shirt sleeve, whether you had a tie on or not, whether you had a musical instrument in the ch in the church. Or it does not matter. What matters is, are you glorifying God? Let us go to James chapter 2, verse 10. That's James chapter 2, verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, is guilty of all. So many take and try to, to break down sin as if sin had categories. All sin is the same. Sin is a willful disobedience of God. I choose to disobey, therefore I have sinned. Christ came to save mankind from sin. He did not come so that we could take and excuse our favorite one. He came to set us free. Let's go on down to James chapter 5, verse 20. Let him know that he that which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall have saved a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. So as we're looking at restoring people who've taken and walked away, we need to understand that, A, we need to deal with them one-on-one, -on -one, but the purpose is to, cut, uh, to, get uh, to take and bring them back to a full relationship so that God can forgive them, so that we better have already forgiven them, and so that they're Restored the whole point is to keep people from going to hell. I don't I don't really care what a person's background is. I care what their relationship with God is. And that's really the position that God wants us to be in. He doesn't I've seen churches that cared about how uh, about people's bank accounts. I've been in churches that cared about the color of their skin. I've been in in, in um, churches that cared about their, uh, their dress style. God doesn't care about any of that. 
What God cares about is are, have they accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and are they living for him? If they're not living for him, he's offering them the way. All they have to do is accept Jesus Christ, ask for forgiveness, turn from their sins, and live up to everything that they know in the scriptures. Walk in the ways of God. Put him first. Anything less is destructive. And it will destroy the soul. We have a society that's trying to rip itself apart. And there are very few things that I can say that would change that as long as they come course they're currently going. Only Christ can change it if they will accept him and if they'll walk in his way. God does not want his people divided. It doesn't matter what position they are in, this, in their lives except whether or not they are saved and living for him. That's all that really matters. There is no, well, I'll take and be a Christian today, but tomorrow I got to go to work, so I'll do something different that day. And then I'll put on my Christian hat again at the end of the week. No. God wants us to be a Christian all the time. In all our dealings, with everybody. It doesn't matter. Let us walk with Christ. Let us be his people. Let us honor him and restore those who are, have had a fault or a sin and bring them back to Christ and full fellowship. Thank you.